in body, mind, and spirit. It's what we are made of, and it's how we experience ourselves and the world that we're a part of. It's also how we should be experiencing our relationship with computers, which make up so much a part of our world these days. This balance between the development of body, mind, and spirit has been asserted by the wise sages of almost every culture throughout history as an essential element in how we grow ourselves as an individual, but also as a civilization. Of course, we have created a lot of disciplines to help us grow in those areas. For the body, we've got yoga, martial arts, gymnastics, and other disciplines. For the mind, we have educational institutions. We've got documentation of knowledge in all forms of media. For the spirit, we have philosophy and aspects of psychology and religious practices. But as computers have become more and more a part of our lives, that balance seems to have slightly gone out of kilter. Computers are great for processing, they're great for learning, they're great for communication. But few would say that they've been an amazing tool for the whole body development and awareness. In fact, they've had a destabilizing effect on our bodies by contributing to a more sedentary lifestyle where we spend more and more of our time sitting using really only our hands. This has led to an epidemic of unfit and in some cases overweight populations in some parts of society. We're at a, a turning point, really, in, in uh, history of how we engage computers and how we are physically engaged by computers. And video gesture control, and by extension, full body immersive video gesture control in virtual worlds is that turning point. And its invention started here in this city at the University of Waterloo back in the early 1980s. At the time, we were looking to create something that would be you know, a unique technology. It took us a long time to invent it, progress through it, pioneer it, evangelize it, and its potential um, is finally starting to take effect today. In fact, I'm using video gesture control right now uh, to present this presentation. Francis McDougall and I were students at the University of Waterloo in the early 1980s, and our initial idea for why we wanted to invent our video gesture control technology was to create a new artistic medium. We wanted to be able to step into the virtual world, to be able to completely unencumbered, without having to wear, hold, or touch anything, and essentially use virtual tools, the same way an artist would use the tools in the real world for creative expression. I was an artist, a dancer, a musician, and I saw this as creating the ultimate performance tool. I was also a student studying to become a psychotherapist who wanted to integrate the creative arts into the therapeutic process. And I saw this as a way of stepping into our dreamscapes and interacting to recreate or role play in real world simulations as therapeutic process. And Francis was a brilliant software designer, but he was also a very embodied dancer. So literally our left and right brain thinking met on the dance floor and this project was begun. But before we even got the prototype started, we realized that we were creating something more than just this initial idea. We were trying to create a natural user interface that would change the way people would use their computers you know, for all aspects of their lives, stepping into 3D virtual worlds to be able to interact with their whole bodies for all sorts of as aspects of collaboration or whatever it might be. Now, this was the early 1980s, and computers were not that advanced. In fact, they weren't even real time. And we needed to have something that had the user's image show up in real time and have this virtual world respond instantly. We knew whatever technology that we were going to choose, that it couldn't take up a whole room, first off, and we'd have to be able to afford it. And our initial attempts to raise the money, we thought we needed to get the half million dollar SGI Iris computer that we thought was so essential to do this didn't really fly. A couple of undergrads with a crazy idea. But luckily, in 1986, after graduating, we were able to create this technology on the Amiga computer, a $4,000 computer. That was simple. Uh, your image showed up only as a silhouette in low resolution. Uh, it was 32 colors, but it was real time, and that's what was really essential. We were able to use this technology as leading edge interactive media artists to mount a ton of interactive, dynamic, engaging virtual world installations. But by 19 91, we had created a full body immersive video gesture system uh, that was able to track the entire body and all aspects of the body, the hands, everything, so that we knew where you were moving by the angle, speed, and trajectory, and we could map that onto the virtual world. 
and essentially the virtual world would react with the proper physics based on what you were doing and as, as you changed. So now we had something where we could hold, touch, throw, push, pull, pick up and do all sorts of things with virtual objects as well as navigate the virtual world with your, your own gestures at the same time. Well, this was about the time that we ended up meeting the virtual reality community that was growing there. We were in stark contrast to a lot of the companies that were creating things that went on your heads, your hands, and your body and tethered you to a computer. We really believed that you needed to step into the virtual world unencumbered because that's how we are in the real world. Well, I was able to use this technology to become the world's first virtual reality performer. Taking audiences around the globe on journeys through dreamscapes, interacting and playing unique virtual instruments. So it wouldn't take long for the fact that people could move around freely and we could challenge and track their speed, agility and flexibility to create immersive video games where you would use your full body. Now this idea that we had this tool would actually be a positive use of technology to enhance whole body development was borne out by the way the worlds of fitness and rehabilitation responded to this technology. Through the mid to late 1990s, we worked with endless physio and rehabilitation therapists who studied the technology and wrote papers essentially on its positive aspects in terms of recovering from injuries, etc. Uh, that could be brain stem injuries, spinal cord injuries, everything from cerebral palsy to stroke patients and, and just joint injuries. All the papers were pretty much saying the same thing. If you step someone into the virtual world and they can see themselves on the screen and they can have dynamic real-time interaction with audiovisual experiences in the moves that they're supposed to do, they'll get lost in it. They'll get incredibly motivated. And they'll be willing to do the rehabilitation two to three times longer than normal. Well, we ended up developing something called the IREX system to let the therapists choose from a series of applications and create exercise regimens. They could play with the length of the applications, where it appeared, how much rest time, as well as aspects of where the animation came from, the speed, the motion, the range of motion. And it was a very positive uh, use of the technology. In fact, we were able to give them for the first time a quantitative database output that they could see how the client was improving over time. And this was quite important. So they weren't the only ones that were actually getting really excited and engaged by this technology. Museums, science centers, science centers and educational institutions were discovering this technology and its motivational factors. The educators knew from the world of brain science uh, and from the deductions of the neuroplasticity of the brain that there's a hierarchy to the learning and retention process. The more senses you engage, the more interaction you have, the more you're going to learn and retain. So if you are seeing something and hearing it and you create a visualization simulation that you can learn from and then you have interaction, you're going to have that much more learning and retention. But when you step into it with your whole body and you use your whole body to interact, there's a whole other kinesthetic learning process that takes place, which is the learning is enhanced by all the extra dynamics of the brain functions that are triggered when you use your different parts of your body, which in turn get connected to the retention of that information and strengthen and create new neural pathways in the brain. So one of the other areas that we experimented in that we thought was really an amazing potential for the future was video conferencing, bringing people together from different parts of the world so they could meet each other in the virtual world. They could see each other and they could talk to each other like they would in a normal video conferencing, but they're in the same virtual world. They could interact with the virtual objects and interact with each other and collaborate together. By 1991, we were using T1 lines over broadband internet to create dynamic virtual reality video conferencing systems, and that was you know, an incredible use of the technology. This technology, the implications and applications for the future of the World Wide Web as it builds itself out into a 3D universe that we meet in to communicate, to collaborate in, and to do our everyday tasks is going to be enormous in the future. We also started looking at how do we apply this technology. We'd 
knew that we had amassed a lot of knowledge on video gesture control, we started looking at the consumer market. We were able to license our patents and our technologies to Sony for the iToy on the PlayStation, to Hasbro for an immersive educational gaming toy for, for kids, Weather Services International for interactive weather reports and news reports, and we ported it over onto, onto cell phones for companies like Docomo and other, other companies where there's now 50 million phones out there where that you can gesture using both your hands as well as moving it in the air. We were also able to more recently license our patents to Microsoft for the Xbox for Kinect-like video gesture control gaming. We looked at how do we take this technology into other areas. We did a lot of public signage, so we turned it on its head and we started inventing interactive surfaces. In 1998, we started to create interactive surfaces like floors and walls and tables and counters and windows. And essentially, we were able to use the cameras to pick up on the user's unencumbered gestures, multiple users at a, t at a time as they pass by or over the displays. This was very successful technology, and now there are thousands and thousands of these systems out around the world. Another amazing invention that we did in 2000 was to create a point and control system, a two-camera array that let us create a floating matrix that you could reach in and take over the XY coordinates so that you can control screens from any distance. And though this was very successful, the most important and powerful application that we created in 2000 was 3D gesture control. Using 3D cameras to get a 3D, three-dimensional depth map of the user's body and track their full body interactions in the 3D space that they were a part of. This took the technology to a completely new level of gesture analysis and control and enhanced every level of how we would actually manipulate and what we could manipulate in the virtual world along with the nature of the actual virtual worlds that we were immersed in. We were able to create a lot of installation for public clients. We learned a lot over the last 10 years of inventing and pioneering 3D gesture control. And mostly what we learned is that it would completely enhance all the other opportunities that we had already pioneered with 2D cameras. We were able to create applications that were for digital signage, for public presentation, for classrooms and for training applications, for rehabilitation, for disabilities, for surgery rooms. We were also able to start to bring it into the home, working with companies like Hitachi, putting 3D cameras into TVs for the home for remote controls and for media centers. And we also worked with the car companies to put the 3D cameras into the cars so you can do 3D gestures in the car while you're driving. <laughs> It'll work, don't worry. Um, so, there's basically, um, it's taken a long time. When we started 10 years ago, the 3D camera cost $20,000. But today we're fairly excited. With Microsoft releasing the Kinect on the, on the Xbox, we have, for the first time, a 3D gesture control camera. Um, and this is, you know, an amazing uh, thing for Francis and I. We've been pioneering and inventing video gesture control for over 28 years, but we realize we're just at the beginning and in the infancy of how this technology will affect the things we can do in our daily lives, how we will interface with computers and the immersive connected computer worlds that are going to come. The 3D cameras that we have today are, in fact, very low resolution. They're going to become higher resolution, and when they do become higher resolution, the type and the accuracy with which we're going to be able to track our gestures, the complexity of the gestures, and the minute gestures that we're going to be able to track are going to be phenomenal. And the applications that we're going to actually get and that we're going to be able to literally step up into are going to be absolutely phenomenal as well, as we literally step up and into the virtual world in body, mind, and spirit. Thank you.